Do you ever feel like a tightwad? Maybe you know you have enough money, you make enough money, you've saved enough money, and you just can't spend those hard-earned dollars on the experiences that, that would ultimately bring more joy to your life and those that are around you. Well, today we're going to talk about why that might be and give you some specific strategies to get that money to work where it really matters. Today's conversation is all about how to spend more money. Welcome to the Retire With Purpose podcast, where it is our mission to help others gain clarity and purpose and elevate meaning in their lives through personal and practical financial strategies. If this is your first time with us, then I want to share with you what to expect. Every other Monday, we provide you with a long-form interview-based podcast. We bring on one of our world-class guests, and we have conversations around life, finances, retirement, so much more. And every Friday, what we're doing here with you today is a time when I'm joined by my good friend, fellow uh, certified financial planner practitioner, Marshall Johnson, here with me. Hey, hey. And this is our opportunity to cover a weekend reading article with you. What is weekend reading? Well, weekend reading is a simple email. It's one email that hits your inbox every single Friday, and it is made up of four articles in the financial planning space, all designed to help you make better decisions about your life and your finances. But you're not just going to receive those articles. This is why you have to get signed up. You receive the articles, but you'll have summaries. You don't even have to read the whole article. You just get the summary. You get my takeaway for that matter. And you'll also receive invitations, special invitations to events, webinars, white paper giveaways, book giveaways, all kinds of great stuff. And for those of you, if you, if you haven't signed up before, when you first sign up, we'll also send you out a free digital copy of my Wall Street Journal bestselling book, Job Optional. Oh, and you get an opportunity to ask our world-class guests your questions as a subscriber. So get yourself signed up by just shooting us a text at 866-482-9559. Just text us WR to that number or check out retirewithpurpose.com. Now, oh boy, we also need you to rate and review the podcast, mm. don't we? We need to make sure we're But wait, getting there's those more. Rate. But wait, there's more. <laughs> That's right. We want you to subscribe. We want you to rate. We want you to review. And this isn't just to get our message out there in the world, right, Marshall? I mean, love you that. And I, love that honest feedback, buddy. We love actually reading those, and we check on them every day. So please subscribe, rate, review the content. Now, I think we should get into the content. How to get clients to spend more money. This is an article from Advisor Perspectives, written by Alan Roth, and it's a good one. Case, you know, <laughs> we we meet with with hundreds and thousands of families over the last 10, 15 16 years for some of us. And uh, I've seen this a lot. This is something that I have seen where people uh, have a, a, a challenge spending, right? All these financial advisors spend all this time calculating safe withdrawal rates and 4% withdrawal rules. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of people that have the money, they're just afraid to spend. Yeah, I mean, the, the open kind of hit me hard because I think we've had so many conversations, you and I, about oh, the 4% yeah. withdrawal rule. Mm -hmm. And what I think we, we've been doing uh, radio shows since 2010, 11, mm -hmm. somewhere in that time. So, so well over a decade, we've been doing a weekly radio show. And I can't, I bet it's in the hundreds how many times that we've had a conversation about a safe withdrawal rate or a 4% yeah, withdrawal right. rule. And yet, the reality is that most of the people that walk into our office that we're working with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm really don't have a, a withdrawal rate problem, right? They have mm. plenty of money. They've saved plenty of money. And once they have an income strategy, what they actually have is a spending problem. Right. They can't spend enough, right? They cannot get themselves to actually enjoy the dollars that they've worked so hard for because of certain psychological barriers that are preventing them from spending to ultimately get more enjoyment and happiness out of their lives. And I think most we, understand we, it, we, well, but they all, can't, they can't with a capital C A N T can't increase their spending, increase their spending. Yeah, but they uh, just emotionally just can't do it. Yeah. And well, and there are some that have legacy goals and that's, what's really driving the lack of spending Different. where 
that's uh, different, different, right? That's we're different. not talking about, uh, you know, if you're someone that is really focused on maximizing your legacy, leaving dollars behind for your kids, grandkids, church, church, charity. charity, right? Mm -hmm. Then, yeah, maybe this isn't you. Maybe that's not the issue. But I will say most of the families that we work with, they don't want to die the richest person in the graveyard. Mm. You know, they worked really hard. They saved the dollars so that they could actually spend them and enjoy those uh, in retirement. Actually, I had someone once tell me that they wanted to spend their last dollar and write a bad check right before they put a nail in the coffin. Yikes. And I, I would tell you that that is more often than not the case, that more often than not, we find the individuals saved, worked, and mm -hmm. then they want to enjoy it. And they don't want to leave a million dollars on the table, $5 million, $10 million on the table. It's just yeah. hard to get over that hurdle of actually starting to spend I, I hear it a lot where, where somebody will say, you know what, our kids are doing better than we ever did. They're making more money than, than we ever did in our best working years, but they still need help, right? So a lot of families want to help along the way, but their goal is not to leave the entire nest egg behind, just live off of the interest or the 4% withdrawal rule. They want to spend and they want to be able to live early in retirement. We talk about those those three phases of retirement. You got the go-go years, you got the slow-go years, and you got the less go, go years. The less go years. Uh, but they want to go in those go-go years. They want to travel. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's where a good rock solid retirement plan with yeah. an income strategy helps them be able to let go of some of that worry, but it's still hard. It, most of the families that we're working with, they are the millionaire millionaire next door. Yeah. You know? And I remember when I was a kid, my dad reading that book. I'm sure I think he read it. He definitely mm -hmm. read it more than once. It seemed like it was always around. It was always on a shelf. Now that same book's on my shelf at home. And I was flipping through it the other day. You know, he's got, you know, right, wrote in the margins, underline things. You know, my oh, dad was funny. really focused on being mm -hmm. the millionaire next door. And most of the families we work with, that's what they are as well. They're, they're, they were typically not necessarily high income earners. They earned a good income, right? Yeah, I mean, they, savers. they weren't in mm -hmm. the, the poverty level, you know, they mm -hmm. earned a really good income, probably, you know, well into the Median. six figures in mm -hmm. some way. Um, but what they did was they, they, they weren't big spenders, right? They weren't right. big on their lifestyle. They didn't let their lifestyle grow along with their income. They just continued to save more and more as their income increased. That is the millionaire next door. So after a lifetime of uh, earning a decent income and more importantly, saving more and more of those dollars and watching your bank account continue to grow, watching your investments continue to grow, getting more and more safety psychologically, financially uh, because of that saving. Now you have built something into your brain chemistry mm -hmm. uh, that is actually affecting your ability to spend in return. Retirement. And this is the kind of research that was done uh, by Scott Rick at the University of Michigan, a behavioral scientist, that showed us that in the brain, when they actually take a look at the human brain uh, using something called a functional magnetic resonance imaging, so an FMRI, mm -hmm. what they actually found, there's an area of brain called the insula. And the insula will light up when you, uh, you know, smell a, a foul sound, it smells a, a bad odor, right? Mine was light enough the other night. I was sitting on the couch. And I'm just, I'm getting all irritated. My wife's sitting next to me. And what is that smell? This is like, go upstairs, right? You need to get out of here. I'm, this is rude. This is disrespectful. Well, about about 10 minutes later, I uh, found out that my wife decided to get a can of fart spray on Amazon. Oh, that's hilarious. And my, that sounds like something Chelsea Oh, my do. insula was lighting right. up. I was so I angry. Thought, <laughs> Why would you do that? Now she, and she was in like the following. House? This like, was in the house? Yeah, I leave the couch to go somewhere else. She follows me over there I'm like and does it again. I go, why would you do that? This is so <laughs> rude and disrespectful. But what was going on? My insula was lighting right, up, right? That and part that of was your leading brain. to irritation. It was leading to anger, yeah. right? And that's what happens when someone that has a lifetime of tight, saving tight and not spending, what mm -hmm. you build up is you build up, you, you get to a point Activity where- Activity in the insula. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. you, you get to a point where it's much, you, you get significantly more activity in that por portion of your brain, the insular portion of your brain, when you go to spend something, than someone that lived a lifetime of spendthrift, yes. a lifetime of spending, those individuals that never had anything, never saved anything, you know, and bought whatever they wanted, 
they don't they don't feel that same level of pain because they haven't built that up yes. in their brain chemistry that activity, over a lifetime. That activity didn't take place in this imaging uh, research that they found. These spendthrifts, you know, they didn't they weren't burdened with that same same problem, right? They were just spending for the sake of spending, and weren't burdened by that pain that you spoke mm -hmm. of. If you'd like to take the information that you've gleaned here to the next level. All you have to do is this, click the link in the description and schedule a 15 minute phone consultation with an advisor on our team where you can get answers to your own unique questions and concerns. The research shows it has nothing to do with your genetics, right? It's all life experience. There's mm -hmm. no genetic correlation to what's actually this, going you in your brain. born this way or that That's way. That's why I'm saying it builds mm -hmm. up. You, you've created this in your brain chemistry over a lifetime of saving, a lifetime of being a <laughs> tightwad, if you will. Mm -hmm. And what they have found in the research is people that are a bit tighter, that, that feel more pain when they spend, they're actually more anxiety prone in general. Mm -hmm. They tend to experience more anxiety in general, which is you know, really explains a lot. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I mean, a light bulb went off with me. I was sitting, sitting with a couple the other day and, and I feel like, um, this, this woman will never retire. Uh, she's got more money and I've, I've showed it to them for years. I mean, this has been going on for years. I've, I've, uh, tried to make the case where she can retire. Now, I think there's a few other reasons why she doesn't necessarily want to retire. And that's in that's elderly parents living at home. I think she's trying to get a get away to go to work. But the reality is she feels like it would take a miracle for her to be able to retire. And so mm -hmm. this, this comment here that the author gave, th that's a real feeling. Like she feels like it's going to take a miracle. And I just, I just showed using logic and math and science that this is very much a reasonable thing and you have more money than you're ever yeah. going to spend, but she still thinks it's going to take a miracle. Well, to add a number to that, 35% of those accumulating a million dollars or more in investable assets think it'll take a miracle to Ooh. ever be able to retire. And and how many people have we helped retire with less than a million dollars? I mean, it's, yeah, it's it doesn't take a million. It yeah. doesn't take a million dollars to retire. And it certainly doesn't take a miracle to retire if you have over a million dollars. What's going on there? It's just it, it is it is simply that individuals that have been more focused on saving that are tight ones, if you will, they simply carry a carry a higher level of psychological anxiety. Right. Mm -hmm. And. There's a second part of that, though. I think there's one part of it that you could say, well, these people have just, uh, they, 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 they get pain. They feel pain when they spend. Yeah, but there's a flip side of that. They get joy, joy. out of mm -hmm. saving, right? It makes them happy when they're able to get a deal. It makes them happy when they're able to put that money into the retirement accounts. I, I'm one of those people that every year when I write the check to the HSA, write the, the check to the 529, yeah. top off the 401k, yeah, th those things bring me joy. A, a sense of joy mm -hmm. and, and maybe it's a sense of pride. I don't know what it is, but there's definitely some kind of dopamine hit, hit that's going on in my brain. That's going, this is, this feels good. Mm -hmm. You know, I like doing this. Actually, a strange thing happened. I don't know if you can tie this into the article, but I felt it was kind of strange for me that I had this experience. And I wonder if there's a tie in here that you can find. So we had our estate plan updated here, uh, a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and leaving the attorney's office, you know, I just, I'd spent some money, but it felt like an investment. And I think most people would have walked away and gone, man, that was terrible. You know, I just spent a bunch of money on an attorney's mm -hmm. waste of money. And I felt like I had just made a big investment. Yeah. Like I felt like I had just made that HSA deposit and mm -hmm. going, heck yeah. You know, this, this feels good. I had a dopamine hit. Like, well, I felt like I was on a high the rest of the day. Yeah. And anybody that knows you loves, knows that you love to cross things off your list. And that was something mm. that had been on your list for 18, 15, 18 months. Right. So you were finally able to cross that off the list. It was an investment. It was an investment yourself and your family, mm. and you know that it's going to pay dividends. It's almost like an insurance policy, if you will, that if something does happen, you know that everything's lined up and your affairs are in order. And I think there is some real relief to that, right? Oh, we, wow. we meet lots of families where they, they, they keep telling me year after year, well, I got to get the will done. I got to update the trust. I got I to gotta do this. I got to do this. And it just feels like it's part of that to-do list. Um, 
but they're they're not prioritizing it. You were able to prioritize it and knock it out. I wonder if that just opens up a, a little door into my hyperopia, right? <laughs> like just that was a phrase I'd never heard of. Yeah, I'm sorry. just it, well, they say it's an aversion to indulgence. You know, I would say it's someone that is. Uh, really focused on the future. Far you know, they're hyper almost focused hi- on, hyper farsighted. Yeah, they're mm-hmm. hyper farsighted. They're looking into the future, and they say, "Well, if you're hyper, if you have hyperopia, then you can't enjoy your money." I don't, I don't think this is always true. Like I said, right. I think we can. What happened there? Uh, I, I found a way to spend money that made me feel like I was gaining more safety, Mm -hmm. right? And that psychologically it was, it was getting me uh, what I needed, even though I was focused on a long-term goal and that's why I spent that money. Mm -hmm. It did putting it in that lens allowed it to be enjoyable. It's kind of like, you got to trick yourself. You know, I went to, (laughs) I'm the same way. I don't like to spend. I like to expend, uh, spend on experiences, but I'm not going to indulge. Like I'm generally not going to go first class. I'm generally not going to upgrade to the corner hotel suite. But I remember going to Vegas during COVID, like, when things were still yes. very cheap. And it's like, I was thinking about the same thing. I had like the nicest room in a very nice hotel. And it was like, well, we oh went my to, God. but it was so cheap because of COVID that it was like indulgence, yeah. but I got it on a discount. Yeah, a discount. So it felt so wonderful. It felt like a reward. Mm-hmm. That was during COVID. We went to Mexico mm-hmm. and flew first class for like, I mean, it was like 50 bucks more to fly yeah. first class. And I felt like I was getting such a deal. Yeah. I was spending money, but I was getting a deal. So it was really helping that, helping me spend money by activating the right side of my brain. I was spending the money, but I wasn't feeling the pain in the insula because I had converted it to me actually spending money psychologically. And that's why I love the focus on Maslow's hierarchy of needs here, because right. I think it has a lot of applications. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, first, physiological, right? We're not talking about individuals that don't have their basic expenses covered. So you already have food, shelter, clothing, and everything you need. What's that next level up? You know, it goes physiological, then it goes to safety, and then it goes to social esteem, self-actualization. So we, we're talking about individuals that already have the physiological need taken care of and also have all the safety needs taken care of, actually. And we could equate safety to savings, safety to cash, safety to having uh, extra dollars on the sidelines at all times. Mm-hmm. And there's a values uh, exercise you can do um, – my good friend Jeff Woods came up with these uh, brilliant things from the One Thing podcast uh, where he used to operate. He actually created these value cards, which are phenomenal. You know, so there's a couple hundred cards. Each of them have a different value. Use them to determine what your values are, what your spouse's values are, what your kids' mm. values are in order That's to cool. put together maybe even company values, your own personal values. You can get them on Amazon. We'll put a link in the show notes if you're interested. You know, but Shout what, out to Jeff. <laughs> yeah, what, what was interesting with those uh, cards uh, in our group, we found that that a lot of the women in our front or dad's group, in our dad's group, a lot of the spouses, uh, they had the value of safety. Safety was one of their number one, if not their number one value, where a lot of the men, it was growth or risk-taking or adventure mm-hmm. or, or social esteem, self-actualization, right? right? And all those things take money. So that can create a marital conflict where you have one spouse that's focused on safety or saving, where you have another spouse that's not so concerned. Maybe they're the risk-taker and they're more into the other parts of the hierarchy. Yeah. In in using spend, spending or expenditures in that way, right? Looking at a massage as a, uh, a hedonistic a- expenditure, or is that an investment in one's health and well-being, right? Mm-hmm. You're starting to frame and reframe these, these big purchases. There's a great, there's several good studies that are highlighted in this article that I wanted to point out from that yeah. University of Michigan study to a, to a Clark Howard thing. And, and ways to spend money, right? Yes. Ways to get over the psychological Such a health. good, such a good article. It not only has great content, yeah. but it also links to some it's other where great the rubber content. hits the road, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, 
Duke behavioral economist, Dan Airely. That was my favorite. So, yeah. and, and this is very similar to what my dad has uh, done in, in his financial income. strategy as well, right? Uh, getting a fixed amount of income every single month. So dad knows every single month how much income he has coming in. Now, Dan Airely, Duke behavioral economist, has said, all right, he set it up so he's pledging to spend at least $120,000 a year. At the end of the year, if he falls short, only spend 100000 then that $20,000 difference goes to charity. Mm-hmm. And my dad does it on a monthly basis. So every month he knows that he have, has X amount of dollars coming in to spend. If there's excess left, then he knows he has to spend it. He'll take his buddies out, pay for them to go golfing, mm-hmm. you know, take you know a bunch of people out to, to, to eat, Get right? some lobsters. He's going to spend mm-hmm. it all. It, it's a bit of a challenge. And I, I, I think it's a fun one. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's great, and it helps it helps somebody spend in a way that they never comprehended before, and help reframe the spending in a mm-hmm. in a healthy psychological way. When well, we've had Dr. David Blanchett on the podcast yeah. before, head of retirement research at Morningstar, mm-hmm. and uh, he wrote uh, along with Michael Finke a paper called "Guaranteed Income: A License to Spend." And I see this hold true all the time, where you know, guaranteed income might result in lower long term returns for your life savings. What it does is it enhances spending significantly Mm -hmm. where you'll find that these individuals that have more certainty around cash flow, more certainty around income, they tend to spend and enjoy the retirement significantly more. Yeah. Well, and I think some of these tips here, Casey, for uh, ideas, ideas to increase spending. Some of my favorite get a screaming deal when you indulge. We talked about that yeah. already. Uh, the next one I really like was pledge to buy something by a future date. Tell your friends and family. It's mm-hmm. kind of like when I told you I was, I'm going to buy a house five years ago or whatever it was like, I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to buy a house. You're pledging to do it. You know, it's expensive. You're going to bite the bullet, but you're going to do it. Yeah. Well, there were a few more. One of them that I noticed that had actually come up in our conversation with Jim Dahl, uh, the white coat investor, was right. using plastic rather than cash. Mm-hmm. He said, you know, he had to get. He actually wrote a paper, uh, I think, eight ways to spend more. And when he was on the podcast, he did discuss uh, how he had to switch to credit card. Right? He was always using cash. You know, always focused on savings. It was but causing switching. him to be more frugal. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so just switching to a credit card, and all of a sudden you will start to spend more and actually enjoy enjoy it that much more. And so th- there's a lot of different options that you could use to elevate your spending and ultimately elevate the experience that you're having in life. I think there's a starting point is starting by realizing where you actually stand. You know, do you have enough for retirement? Are you on your track to be able to retire when you want to retire? Are you financially independent today? Are you job optional, right? So do the math and do the work because far too often we just find that people don't do the work and they've spent an extra five or 10 years working, saving, pinching pennies when they could have been doing a lot of the things they wanted to enjoy in life. And number two is then what do you value? What are your values? You know, do you value safety? Is that your core value? Uh, or do you value those social interactions? Do you value, uh, you know, charitable giving, self-actualization? Do you value esteem, you know, taking care of you know, dental work or getting a personal trainer? You know, where do your values land? And you should put the money where the values land, right? Make sure that your financial strategy is set up to help deliver you a better experience in life. Elevating meaning in life comes out of putting the dollars where the values are. 